I'd like to invite any kids forward for the children's message. Come on up and join me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, I'm going to teach you guys a new word today. And if anybody knows what this word is, you can tell me what it means. The word is tithe. Anybody know what that word means? You don't know? What, is, what do you think it means? Oh, it kind of sounds like that word tide, doesn't it? But it's tithe with a T-H-E. Yeah. I bet everybody out there knows what it is and they're all nervous right now. Water? No, it, a tide. What do you think it means? Oh, like you tie at a race. No, it's, it's kind of like, no, it's a little bit different than that. So the word tithe is, is something that they use in the Old Testament and in the New Testament time frame where it talked about how you are to give to the church. You're to tithe. And a tithe was considered to be a tenth of whatever you had. So that's, this is some math, okay? A tenth of whatever you had. So I have in my hand 10 pennies. And if I have 10 pennies... And I'm going to create a tithe. How many pennies do you think it would be to be a tithe? What do you think it would be? Five? five. five? Well, that would be half. I only want to do a tenth. Ten. Ten? All of them? Oh, you're special. Yes. <laughs> what do you think it is? Um, I have no idea. One hundred? If I had a hundred pennies, it would be a little different. How many do you think it is? If I'm going to do a tenth of it, which how many do you think there are? One. That's right. I'm going to give one penny. If I have ten, I'm going to give one. So if I'm going to tithe to the church and I have ten pennies, I'm going to give the church one penny and I'll keep the other nine. But let me ask you this. How many of you all have something in your house that maybe you have ten of? Do you have any ten of anything? What do you have ten of what? Um, ten, fruit. ten fruit? Oh, that's a good one. Ten fruit. What about you? What do you have ten of? Ten quarters. You have ten quarters? What do you have ten of? Do you have 10 toys? What about 10 books? What do you have 10 of? Oh, oh really? Eye shadows. shadows? What do you have? I forgot mine. You forgot your... Ten dollars. So if we have 10 of all these things, how many, what do you have 10 of? I have 10 cherries. 10 cherries. <laughs> would, you, would you be willing to give one of those cherries to the church to help somebody? No. What about, what about some of that fruit? What about one of those toys? What about, what about some of the things that we have 10 of? Would you be willing to give some of that stuff to the church to help? Because that's what a tithe was. Back in the old time, back in the Old Testament, they would give the pennies and they would give their stuff to the church. So that way, if somebody was not from there, if somebody wasn't from that area, they could get help from the church. If somebody didn't have a mom and a dad, they could go to the church and get help. If somebody was a widow, that means that their husband or their wife died, they could go to the church and get help. So that, that one-tenth, was meant to help other people because that's what the church was for. That's what the church was for. Today we're going to hear about a woman that comes to the church and she is going to bring something called her. She's going to bring her coins to the church. These are two small copper coins. And you can see them right there. These are, these are what the old coins would have looked like back at the time when Jesus was around. These are what the coins kind of looked like back then. Yeah, aren't those cool? So she had these two coins, and these were only worth about a penny. So it's not much money at all. And she only had two of them. And guess what she did? She gave, she gave all of them to the church. She gave everything to the church. And we're going to talk about that today, about what that means. Why would she give everything that she had to the church? She was a widow. She should be receiving from the church, and yet she gave everything that she had. We're going to talk about that today, about what does it mean that we give, and why are we giving? And where is God in all of this? So listen today to the sermon. We're going to talk more about it. And if you want to see these coins later on after church, I'll show you more. Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for being with us as we discover you dwelling among us at a time whenever we have lots of questions and we're wondering how to give at such a time as this. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So somehow, some way. After an election, I end up preaching. It happened four years ago. It happened eight years ago. It happened 12 years ago. And I'm going to say exactly what I said at each of those things. On Wednesday morning, 50% of the population of America woke up excited, elated, and hopeful about the future. 50% of the population of America woke up scared, fearful, and worried about the future of America. 
and God loves 100%. And so do the pastors of this congregation. So where are we to find hope and good news in the middle of such a divided country and a divisive time? Well, lucky for us, we've got a book for that. And we're going to take a look at what Scripture has to speak to us today and see the good news of Jesus Christ shared through Scripture. Today we have the gospel lesson about the widow's offering, the widow's might, the widow that comes and shares all that she has out of her, uh, uh, out of her poverty. And um, this is a lesson that is historically in November because it's part of stewardship campaigns. I mean, after all, if she gave all, why can't you, right? That's not what we're going to talk about, though. Um, the people that put together the lectionary years and years ago decided to put lessons during the season of November, or during the month of November, because most congregations at that point in time are having a stewardship campaign where they're asking people to pledge so that way they can make a budget in December and then approve it in January. But it's a very secular way of looking at things, especially when you're considering the Scripture. Um, and, and we're not doing that this year. Um, in fact, our focus during our stewardship campaign is giving thanks. Thank you to the congregation for all that you have done and continue to do in and through Abiding Presence uh, for its mission and ministry. And more is going to happen during our offering message today. So we're going to let that be there. And we're going to talk about something else about what the scripture is speaking to us. Um, and, and you all know my preaching style. I like to consider what's going on before and what's happening after this little piece of, of, of scripture that we have and place it into its own context to better understand what God is speaking to us today uh, through scripture. So if you'd like to follow along, I encourage you to pull open your Bibles, uh, your pew Bibles to page uh, 825 to Mark 12. Um, I'm going to look a little bit at Mark 11 and also Mark 13, just, just to reference that. Because some pretty interesting things happen in our scripture today. Um, and, uh, and I want you to pay attention, close attention to where Jesus is located at each of these points along the way. So in, in Mark 11, Jesus enters into the temple and he overthrows the tables and he chases out the money changers, right? We all know this story. Um, so he's already upset the apple cart and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes of the temple are really upset because he's disturbing their place of power. And how in the world are they supposed to operate if this guy's coming in here and messing everything up? And so they begin to start to try to trap Jesus, to catch him. Uh, and so Jesus ends up showing back up the next day inside the temple. He comes right back to where he was. After proclaiming that this is my father's house, you've made it a den of thieves, a den of robbers. So he comes back and he's inside the temple and he's walking around inside the temple. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees are all trying to trap him, giving him all kinds of questions. And every time he answers, he points to either God or he points to helping others. He's always pointing back to God or pointing to help others. And then comes Mark 12, 28. And before we jump into that, just to let everybody know, this is the appointed lesson for last weekend. However, most congregations, including ours, never read this lesson. Because we celebrate all saints, and we should, and it's an important day for us to celebrate, to recognize those that have gone before us. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the year. But because of that, we don't ever really read this lesson. So let's take a look at it real quick. Mark 12, 28. There's the scribe, one of these people that's been challenging Jesus, comes forward, and his question to Jesus is, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus begins to quote scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And the second is just as great. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And again, Jesus is pointing to love God, love others like self. The catch is that this scribe is like, yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. In fact, this is more important than any gift that I bring to the offer, any burnt sacrifice that I offer up, anything that I leave. This is so much more important than that. And that's when Jesus says something that he doesn't say anywhere else, even to any of his closest followers. He says, you are so close to the kingdom of God. Isn't that powerful? He looks at this one scribe that finally is understanding it, and he says, you're so close to the kingdom of God. You've got it. Love God with everything that you have and love others around you just like you love yourself. And he continues to walk around the temple, inside the temple. 
And his disciples are asking him some questions, and, and, and others are, are still challenging him. And that's where we get to today's lesson, where Jesus says, Beware of scribes who like to walk around in flowing long robes and say long, windy prayers and like to have the best seats at the table and at the banquets. And yes, I'm very aware I'm wearing a long, flowy robe and I say prayers. It's not lost on me. Absolutely. So uh, I, I love that some newlyweds are here because I just did their wedding and they're back there. Um, uh, because I go to do weddings a lot and I go to receptions afterwards. And uh, I don't know why, but they never placed me at the table with the bride and the groom. I never get to sit at those places of honor at banquets. I'm always stuck at the kids' table in the back in the small chairs, you know? And then they call me up for the prayer afterwards, right? But it would be really rude, right? It would be rude, Kaylee, if I was to walk up behind you guys and pull up a seat between you as you're celebrating your reception. It would look really odd to put the focus on Steve because I'm a pastor, right? I mean, that would be rude, right? Jesus is saying to, to his followers at this point in time, beware of these scribes that are just focused on themselves because they're not loving God. That's not their focus. They're not focused on serving others and loving others as they love themselves. They want the places of honor. And then he says they devour widows' houses. And that is a loaded statement. Devour widows' houses. As I, as I alluded to with the children that that the widows were to be taken care of by the church. That if, if a loved one passed away, the church was going to be there for it. That the tithe was going to help them. That the money that was raised was going to make sure that they were taken care of. They could come to the temple to find resources and support and help, a place of peace. But over time, through different laws, tradition of the elders and Corbin laws, all of a sudden, the church, the temple, was taking the estate of the deceased man. Now, granted, most widows were much younger, or most women were much younger than men when they were married. So there was a lot more widows than there were widowers at the point in time. And um, so, I'm sorry, I've just got off to it. Do you want me to answer it? <laughs> let, me get, let me get back. I apologize, I apologize. Um, these laws has changed over time to where now, the church is taking the estate that, that could support this person, and now this person is left with nothing, absolutely nothing. And what are they to do? What resource do they have? They have now become the most vulnerable in society. And as if almost on cue, Jesus and his followers begin to leave the temple right then and there. And notice where he takes a position. It says in our scripture, he sits opposite of the treasury and here's where we follow jesus now leaving the temple leaving the church stepping out and all of a sudden these people are coming in they're bringing in their offering they're bringing in their wheat they're bringing in their their animals for the sacrifice they're bringing in their their bags of money and they're dumping it into the treasury and they're all bringing out of their abundance and jesus points to this widow who comes in holding two small copper coins worth about a penny and she gives them. And yeah, that would make an amazing stewardship sermon. She's giving everything that she has to the church because that's where her heart is. One of my seminary professors, Eliseo Perez Alvarez, he, he described this as a hunger strike, that this is all she has left. The church has taken everything else. What more could they do with a penny's worth of money? That's all I have. It's not going to make much difference to them. Here, take it. You've taken everything else. And so she dumps it in there and she turns and she walks away, literally to walk away to die. And she's gone. And Jesus sees her. And you would think at the position he is opposite of the treasury, devouring widows' houses, seeing a widow come across right away, talking to the scribe about loving God and loving others, that the disciples would be like, okay, we see it. We get it, Jesus. This makes sense. And then they leave the temple. And they're walking out of the temple, and Jesus won't go back in the temple at this point in time. And as they're walking away, the disciples tap him on the shoulder, and they're like, Hey, Jesus, look. Look how beautiful that building is. Look how beautiful the stones are. Look how beautiful the temple is. Isn't it great? Almost as if to say, when you take over, this is going to be ours. And we're so excited about that. Isn't this wonderful? And they've missed it. They've missed it. And Jesus says, as soon as they do this, you know that these stones aren't going to last. 
they're not going to stand forever. And then he takes them and he gets up on Mount Olive and he's sitting opposite of the temple now. He has slowly moved his way out from inside the temple opposite. And his disciples are saying, well, when is this going to happen? When will these when will all the stones be toppled over? And, and Jesus says, beware of those that come saying, I am he. Beware of those that are going to lead you astray. You have work to do between now and then. There's something more for you to do. And in chapter 13, verse 10, he says, the good news must be proclaimed first to all. Jesus continually points to God. He continually points to loving others as we love ourselves. And he's doing that with the scribes and the Pharisees. He's doing that with the disciples. And they can't see it. One scribe out of all of them grasps it for a second. And I'd love to say, that's us. <laughs> that's not us. We're all the other scribes. We're the disciples. We're along with them because we also too are selfish and self-centered in that whole place as well. We're about to walk into a holiday season where we're going to sit around a table with loved ones. And it's going to be... Hard to have conversations because people have voted differently. And we're going to find that division come and meet us. And it's not because of a political candidate. It's because of the people that are sitting next to you in the pews. It's because of the family members that we have. And it's hard. I heard multiple people coming out of church last night and this morning talking about, I don't know what we're going to do whenever this meal comes. How hard it is to love God and love others like we love ourselves whenever we believe so diametrically different. It is a difficult place for us to be, especially in America where we're experiencing such division. And yet, Jesus is calling us to transcend that. What is he asking of us? Love God with everything that you have. And love others like you love yourself. Because that's where the kingdom of God is. That is the kingdom of God. And it's not something that we aspire to bring about in some future date. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come, where? On earth, right now. As in this moment, it's available right now. Even in the moment of great division, even in the moment of great discord, where we feel such hurt and pain with each other. Thy kingdom can come right now. It's difficult for us to do at times to love God and to love each other. But that is in and of itself our call. And if you're having a hard time doing this, then we can also take a lesson from Jesus, who not only points to one scribe that he doesn't condemn them. He's constantly inviting them back into the fold. He's constantly trying to bring people back into this place. He doesn't like leave them and say, well, like, since you don't get it, I guess you're not worth it. No, he goes back into the temple. He goes back trying to pull them back together. And he sees one that grabs it. But he also sees the person that needs the most help among them. There are vulnerable among us. Some of them are in our own families. Do we see them? Who have we devoured? Who have we devoured? Maybe we can also try to see those people. And if we can't think of them, then we can ask God, show them. So that I might be of service to them. Because we live in a world that we have, well, we have this beautiful church with beautiful stones, don't we? But today is a really great opportunity for us to seek God and to serve others, to love God and to love others like we love ourselves, regardless of how somebody votes, regardless of how divided we may feel in this moment. We've been called to transcend that. And that's where the kingdom of God is made known.